Hello. This next presentation will cover disorders of the gastrointestinal and genital urinary systems. Here are the required readings from the Goodman text, and also I would recommend listening to the Saccone lectures for pharmacology for the GI system. Let's begin by reviewing some of the pain patterns related to the gastrointestinal system. As you can imagine, many of these structures can certainly refer to the abdomen as well as potentially into the chest area. These structures can also refer into the back and potentially even shoulder regions as well structures that are a little bit uh, higher in the GI system like the esophagus and stomach may have a tendency to refer up into the thoracic spine region while structures relating to the lower GI system like the colon would have a tendency to refer lower into the lumbosacral region. This slide deals with some of the symptoms that we may see if the gastrointestinal system is affected with disease. Take a moment and review the list and ensure that you are familiar with each of these different symptoms of the gastrointestinal system. The first disorder that we'll discuss is a disease that influences the esophagus called gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD for short. GERD is caused by inflammation of the esophagus that results from backflow of the gastric juices from the stomach. Normally, the lower esophageal sphincter stays closed and the gastric juices remain in the stomach. However, if the lower esophageal sphincter loses tone, as we sometimes see with age, we can see that gastric juices may backflow up into the esophagus and influence that tissue. This is commonly thought of as heartburn and is once again commonly seen with increased age, especially in individuals over 50 years of age. The gastric juices are primarily comprised of hydrochloric acid, bile, and pancreatic juice and it can cause inflammation of the esophagus when it comes into contact with it. The symptoms of GERD, as you'd expect, heartburn, but also potentially difficulty uh, swallowing and a painful burning sensation in the abdominal region that may radiate up into the chest, even into the neck or the jaw. So when do we commonly see the symptoms associated with GERD? Most of the time we see this after meals, especially with recumbency or bending forward into lumbar flexion. The damage over time uh, can lead to concern with the pharynx and the larynx, and we could even see symptoms associated with uh, speech, including laryngitis and a horse uh, morning hoarseness, uh, difficulty speaking first thing in the morning because some of those gastric juices may have uh, irritated the esophagus and up into the pharynx and larynx overnight. The diagnosis of this is going to be in part through a history, uh, but also a barium swallow examination where we can get a better understanding of the swallowing mechanism as well as visualization of the tissue through endoscopy. It is important that the symptoms of GERD are in fact differentiated from chest pain or angina, um, as that would also be in the differential. And then finally, there is a link um, of GERD with esophageal cancer. We spoke about this with respect to our oncology lectures, as these cells, when they're exposed to gastric acid, may become, uh, we may see signs of metaplasia as well as dysplasia, and then eventually uh, 
uh, cancer in the form of an adenocarcinoma in that particular region. So the treatment of GERD primarily relates to lifestyle management in the form of dietary restrictions, uh, being very cautious with the foods that are eaten, especially spicy foods and foods eaten uh, close to bedtime. Things like nicotine, alcohol, salicylates, which are an aspirin compound and other NSAIDs should be avoided as these could potentially also irritate the stomach and the esophagus as well. Remaining upright after meals and avoiding lying down or recumbent positions is also very helpful. And if it's severe enough, surgical management may be indicated to restore some of that tone in the lower esophageal sphincter region. Next, let's talk about diseases that affect the stomach and the primary disease that we'll discuss here will be peptic ulcer disease. As you recall in the stomach, there's a mucosal lining that protects the tissue from the acid in the stomach. And peptic ulcer disease is primarily a break in that protective mucosal lining and so we now have these gastric secretions irritating that lining of the stomach. There are two types of ulcers that comprise peptic ulcer disease. The first is a gastric ulcer, which would be an ulcer in the stomach. And the second would be a duodenal ulcer, which occurs in the first part of the small intestine. This is a relatively common disorder and we mostly see gastric ulcers in folks who are a little bit older, over 60, and duodenal ulcers seem to be a bit more common in individuals um, who are younger, and we see a peak incidence in individuals in their 30s. The causes of peptic ulcer disease are multi multifactorial. First, genetics plays a role in this, uh, the chemical component deals with the hydrochloric acid um, affecting the lining of the stomach and the duodenum. And there's also a bacterial component, a specific bacteria called H. pylori can cause peptic ulcers as well. The risk factors, smoking, alcohol, chronic use of NSAIDs, and that bacteria I just mentioned, H. pylori, can all potentially be related to causing peptic ulcer disease. And when we think about um, what's actually happening with these ulcers, when we deal with gastric ulcers in the stomach, it's a defective mucosal lining in that particular case. And with respect to the duodenum, it's from gastric hypersecretion from the stomach. And as it passes along through that initial um, part of the small intestine, it can irritate the lining there as well. And the Lesions here are primarily from erosion of the lining of the stomach, which is quite painful. And that's the primary symptom that folks usually present to their physician with is pain associated with this disorder. The primary symptoms associated with peptic ulcer disease are pain in the epigastric region, and the pain may come in waves and it has a tendency to wax and wane. Pain may also radiate to the back, especially to the thoracic spine region if the duodenum is involved. And the primary symptoms would be nausea, loss of appetite, and potentially if severe enough, even vomiting. And if the erosion is severe enough, you could potentially see hemorrhage, uh, which could lead to anemia and complaints of fatigue. You could also potentially see melana, which are black tarry stools if you have bleeding in the duodenum or the stomach. As I mentioned previously, one of the major risk factors for peptic ulcer disease is chronic use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and GI complications uh, specifically, peptic ulcer disease is the 15th most common cause of death uh, 
in the United States. And one of the reasons why is that many patients don't even realize that they have a GI bleed if they're taking non-steroidals because they block the pain associated with the lesion. These uh, non-steroidals are extremely common in adult outpatient orthopedic clinics as about 8 out of 10 patients are going to use these. Um, some of the risk factors that we see for a gastric event associated with chronic non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug usage would be age over 65, a history of multiple NSAIDs being taken at the same time, something like a patient taking Motrin for their back and perhaps Naproxen for their knee, which would be a contraindication. Um, another risk factor for peptic ulcer disease or a GI complication would be a history of previous peptic ulcer disease. And then finally, a history of systemic illness like rheumatoid arthritis or hypertension, as these would increase, significantly increase the chance that an individual could potentially develop a GI bleed. So once again, the primary risk factors for an NSAID-related GI bleed are age, over 65, multiple use of NSAIDs at the same time, a prior history of peptic ulcer disease, and a history of systemic disease like rheumatoid arthritis or high blood pressure. As I mentioned on the last slide, about 8 out of 10 of patients who see physical therapists in an adult outpatient orthopedic clinic are going to use some type of non-steroidal or aspirin-related product. We listed the risk factors out on the last slide, but they're here again for you. Um, at least half of folks are going to have at least one GI complication risk factor, and probably anywhere between 10 to 15 percent will have likely two risk factors. But the risk factors are important because if the risk factors are present um, for uh, gastric uh, bleed, we should know about these and intervene appropriately. I mentioned before that you could potentially get pain in the abdomen or potentially pain in the back with these GI bleeds. If you're dealing with a gastric ulcer that's affecting the stomach, it's more common to potentially see uh, belly pain associated with this. As you can see on your left, that's pain up in the epigastric region. But the duodenum is most likely uh, going to cause back pain in the majority of individuals, especially at that thoracolumbar junction region. And take a moment just to review the anatomy of the gastrointestinal system, but you can see the positioning of the stomach. Once again, a bleed in the stomach would likely cause belly pain, while the duodenum, which is retroperitoneal, is more likely going to cause a bleed in that area, is more likely going to cause back pain, especially in that thoracolumbar junction region. When diagnosing peptic ulcer disease, it's always best to start with a good history to determine if the individual has potential risk factors and the symptoms associated with the disorder. Gastroscopy would also be used to visualize the stomach and the duodenum looking for bleeds. And a culture for H. pylori would also be done to determine if that particular bacteria is present as that can cause peptic ulcer disease. The treatment of peptic ulcer disease is really, again, multifactorial. The goals being to relieve symptoms, promote healing, and prevent complications like a full-blown GI bleed, and prevent recurrences of the disorder. The management of peptic ulcer disease is primarily done through pharmaceuticals. We could potentially see things like antacids, H2 blocking agents, or proton pump inhibitors prescribed by the physician that would potentially help. And if H. pylori is the culprit, we would see antibiotics or other antimicrobials prescribed to assist with the uh, management of the disorder. If there's perforation of the stomach of the duodenum, that would require surgical intervention. As I mentioned in the previous slide, two of the more common medications that are used to treat peptic ulcer disease 
are H2 blocking agents and proton pump inhibitors. The important thing to know here is that the parietal cells in the stomach are responsible for producing hydrochloric acid and both the H2 blocking agents and proton pump inhibitors work really at the level of the parietal cell to influence the production of hydrochloric acid. The H2 blocking agents um, block the ability of histamine to bind to these H2 receptors. And if you limit the ability of histamine to bind to those H2 receptors, um, that really takes away one of the key stimuli in, in the production of hydrochloric acid. Key drugs that are commonly seen um, on the market, and you can buy these over the counter, um, those H2 blocking agents are Pepsid, Zantac, and Tagamet. And again, these used to be prescription only, but now you can buy them over the counter and patients take them all the time. It's one of the uh, most commonly used drugs in this country. Um, another very, very common drug that's used in this country are proton pump inhibitors. And these have really uh, superseded H2 blocking agents as being the prime uh, medication of choice to really uh, assist in the healing of these peptic ulcers. And these proton pump inhibitors really work at the level of the gastric proton pump by inhibiting the secretion of hydrogen ions into the stomach. And if hydrogen ions can't be uh, secreted into the stomach, um, we can't form hydrochloric acid, which again is very, very helpful for individuals who are dealing with peptic ulcers because we really limit the amount of hydrochloric acid that's formed and that, that, that allows those ulcers uh, a chance to heal. Let's move on to diseases that primarily affect the intestines and the one that we'll speak mostly about is irritable bowel syndrome. Many symptoms can be seen with irritable bowel syndrome. We can certainly see symptoms associated with GI function. We can also see abdominal pain and cramping. And we can also see symptoms like anxiety, depression, and loss of appetite associated with this disorder. It is the most common disorder of the GI system. And it's important to note that this is not necessarily an inflammatory disorder of the colon. And there are several different names associated with irritable bowel syndrome. And you could see things like nervous indigestion, functional dyspepsia, a nervous or irritable colon, uh, sometimes used interchangeably with this disorder. As I mentioned previously, irritable bowel syndrome is not an inflammatory disorder associated with the GI system. And there usually aren't any anatomic abnormalities or underlying organic disease associated with the disorder. The conventional thinking now is that IBS or irritable bowel syndrome is really a reaction of the digestive tract to stress and diet, and it alters the motility of the intestine. And so we could potentially see symptoms associated with IBS related to pain in the abdomen, cramping, but we could also see an alternating pattern of diarrhea and constipation uh, due to that uh, change in motility of the intestine. Like the other disorders we've discussed already for the GI system, the diagnosis is usually initiated through a very, very good history and also a sigmoidoscopy so you can visualize um, the colon and ensure that there are no other possible pathologies that could be mimicking irritable bowel syndrome. It's important to note that the condition is not life-threatening, despite the fact that the symptoms are very, very challenging uh, for many patients. And the prognosis is really quite good uh, for controlling symptoms if treatment uh, can be based around stress reduction, uh, exercise, you could potentially see some pharmacologic management associated with this, and then figuring out what foods may potentially trigger IBS and trying to modify the diet accordingly. Next, we'll discuss genital urinary pathology. And in this section, we'll discuss acute cystitis, pyelonephritis, nephrolithiasis, and benign prosthetic hyperplasia.
We'll start with acute cystitis. This is also known as a bladder infection or a urinary tract infection. And the diagnosis is usually clinical and it's based upon a cluster of signs and symptoms that could relate to painful urination, uh, frequency, urgency, hesitancy, uh, pain in the suprapubic region, and if there's uh, blood in the urine. On the last slide, we describe some of the symptoms that might be seen with acute cystitis. It's important to note that this is not a systemic illness, so you won't typically see symptoms like fever, chills, sweats, or even malaise associated with this disorder. The most common organism is commonly E. coli, and this is a disorder that's much more common in women than men. Um, it's also a very, very common, um, a very, very common uh, hospital-acquired infection, uh, comprising about 40% of nosocomial infections that we see in the hospital. And the key here is really to really limit the use of Foley catheters, and if they're used, uh, to um, terminate their use as soon as possible. Acute cystitis is diagnosed through urinalysis and culture, and it's treated quite easily with a short course of antibiotics, and it usually responds well to treatment. If the infections are persistent, it could potentially indicate that there's some type of anatomic abnormality or that we're dealing with uh, resistant organisms causing the disorder. The next disorder we'll discuss is pyelonephritis, and this is also known as an upper tract bacterial infection or kidney infection. So this is a disorder that moves beyond the urinary bladder up through the ureters into the kidneys. And the keys to diagnosis here are the presence of systemic symptoms like fever and malaise. We're also going to see flank pain or pain in the area of the costal vertebral angle. And there'll also be voiding symptoms that are very, very similar to what we saw with the UTI or acute cystitis. You could also potentially see nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain associated with this disorder. This slide highlights the pain pattern presentation that we may see associated with pyelonephritis. Percussion over the kidney could also be an important physical examination finding that may help in your diagnosis of pyelonephritis. Pyelonephritis is diagnosed through urinalysis and culture, and this is a, uh, a concerning disease. Um, many patients are going to require hospitalization and IV antibiotics, but there are going to be some that may be treated as an outpatient if they're not showing signs of severe systemic illness. Um, again, the prognosis is good if the treatment is initiated in a timely fashion. The next disorder we'll discuss is nephrolithiasis or kidney stones. And these are most common in individuals 30 to 50 years of age, much more common in men versus women, and they're characterized by severe excruciating flank pain or pain in that area of the costal vertebral region. With respect to diagnosing kidney stones, X-rays are commonly used and we may see a radiopaque structure either in the kidney or the ureters. Um, we can also use ultrasound to pick up on a kidney stone. CT scan would also commonly be used to diagnose this. And with respect to a physical examination finding, we will see hematuria in about 95% of individuals with this disorder. I mentioned before that the primary symptom with kidney stones is severe excruciating pain. And on the left, you can see an x-ray image of a staghorn calculi, which is um, just a type of kidney stone that we see. And you can see the shape of the kidney stone and the projections off of it. And you can imagine the pain that would be associated with that as we see that passing through the kidney and through the ureters. And on the right is what the stone looks like after it has been passed. With respect to managing kidney stones, the first is going to be medication to assist with pain relief. 
while the stone is passing. If there's an infection, antibiotics will be used. Fluids are going to be important as well to ensure that um, uh, the stone passes. And if um, the stone doesn't pass, the options would be uteroscopic removal or lithotripsy, which is shockwave therapy to break up the stone and allow those smaller particles to pass. The last disorder we'll discuss is benign prosthetic hyperplasia, or BPH. And this is a disorder that's extremely common in men over 50 years of age. We see it much more common in African-American men than we do Caucasian men, and it's characterized by decreased urine stream and force uh, hesitancy, as well as nocturia, which means the individual is getting up uh, more often than usual in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. On the left, we see an image of a normal prostate in relation to the urinary bladder and the urethra. And on the right, we see an enlarged prostate, and you can see how it could potentially influence or compress the urethra and the bladder and cause some of the symptoms that we spoke about on the last slide in terms of decreased stream and force of urine as well as urinary hesitancy. With regard to treatment of BPH, one of the medications that's commonly used are alpha blockers. Uh, these are medications that are effective in relaxing the muscles of the prostate and the bladder neck and that can allow urine to flow more freely. Surgical options would be TERP or transurethral resection of the prostate. And this is a common procedure that's done with many individuals who have BPH. This concludes our talk on GI and UG pathologies.